Well, good morning, Mission. How are you this morning? Man, oh man, it's so good to be with you, to be back with you. My name is Ian, and uh, we love you guys. We're cheering you guys on from Middle Tennessee. Uh, I do need to get this out of the way, though. I'm from Detroit, and so I don't know what a Super Bowl is. Is that <laughs> something that people are <laughs> interested in? Yeah, I wouldn't know anything about it. Uh, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6 this morning, if you want to turn there. Some of you are like, it's, it's going to be that kind of morning, huh? Judges? Yeah, Judges chapter 6 is where we're going to be, and we're starting a brand new series called Bury the Lead which is a phrase I totally knew before this series. Essentially, here's kind of the aim for the series, though. We want to look at stories in Scripture where maybe we've missed the main point, right? Like Jonah isn't ultimately about a whale. Samson isn't ultimately about having long, flowing hair. Like, what is the story underneath the story? And uh, we're going to kind of take a deeper dive these next few weeks in exploring some of that. So with that, before we do anything else, uh, I'd love to pray with and for us, and, uh, and then we'll dive in. Let's pray. God, what a, what a gift it is uh, to be together. God, help us to never forget what a gift that is, to sing and celebrate as loud as we want. God, we pray for brothers and sisters around the globe who don't have such freedoms. Uh, God, with these next minutes together, would they not just simply be about hearing or saying some words, God, but would your spirit and presence and power move in our midst, God, to heal and redeem and restore and call out in ways that only you can. We thank you, God, and we love you. And we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. I, uh, I heard a story a few years ago. It was actually an experiment that took place in New York City. And here's essentially the experiment. They got 10 volunteers together. And then they got like a Hollywood makeup artist and said, hey, we're going to put this big, gnarly, terrible scar on your face. And then send you out to the city and observe how people treated you differently. And then kind of gather all your data. So these people came. And they sat in a makeup chair, some of them for hours, and this professional makeup artist put this like huge, enormous scar all the way across their face. But one thing they actually didn't tell the volunteers was that right before they were sent out into the city, uh, the makeup artist would say, oh, I have to just touch up one last thing. And then without them knowing it, take the scar off their face completely. So they're heading out into the city thinking they have this big, nasty scar on their face. They head out into the city, and when they came back, 10 out of 10 of them said, oh, people treated me so differently because of that scar. I could tell that people were like staring at me, that people were like laughing at me, that like people were avoiding me and like giving me eyes. A scar, mind you, that actually wasn't there at all. 10 out of 10 of them came back and reported that they were treated wildly different. So here's kind of my big idea for today, is that activity flows out of our identity. What we believe to be true of ourselves will inescapably shape the kind of life that we live. Our activity flows from our identity. People may not always live what they profess, but they'll always live what they believe. Does that make sense? It's one thing to speak or confess or to tweet or to type. People may not always live what they profess, but they will always live what they believe. And here's what I found to be true after almost 20 years of pastoral ministry, is that we're all sharing our faith, whether we intend to or not. All the time, every single one of us, whether you consider yourself a religious person or not, whether you're unsure about this whole Jesus, Bible, church thing or not, we are all sharing our faith, whether we intend to or not. The question is, do you know what you have your faith in? So today I want to I look at a pretty unlikely character, and uh, his name is Gideon. Now, Gideon is famous for putting those Bibles into every hotel room you've ever seen, and um, listen, those are the kinds of jokes you can expect today. That's, the, that's, that's about as good as they get. But Gideon's story is a story of identity, and maybe more pointedly, of imposter syndrome, of, of shame, of fear. And before we go any further, let me just say, that's my story. I, I share this story not as someone who's like arrived or figured it out, but someone who still, in many ways, battles shame and fear and identity. But that's Gideon's story here. So here's a little bit of the context. Uh, people called the Midianites had ruled over Gideon and the Israelites for like seven years. And they were cruel. They were cruel people. They like destroyed all their crops. They took all their cattle. And uh, things were so bad, in fact, that the Israelites were hiding in caves. Like that's the situation for them. Things are not going well for them. So the Israelites, they cry out to God to send someone to deliver them. And as God often does, he chooses a very unlikely person. 
So I wanna, I wanna present four experiences, and my question for us, my challenge for us, is to see ourselves at least in one of those four experiences. I want you to ask right now, God, what would you have me learn through this story? How can this story help me right here and now? So the, the first experience I'm calling the potential. We begin in Judges chapter six, verses 11. It says, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now that may not mean a whole lot to us, uh, but a wine press is essentially just a hole in the ground. And it would not make a whole lot of sense normally to thresh the wheat because you, yeah, that's the separating the wheat from the chaff. You would normally want to do that where there's wind because the wind would kind of help separate those things. But Gideon is so fearful, is so afraid that he's, he's doing this task in a hole. I, I actually think Gideon has two enemies. The one that's obvious, it's this external enemy of the Midianites, but I think the other enemy is internal, it's fear. It's shame, it's self-doubt. I just gotta ask, has anyone ever been there before? Maybe, maybe you're there right now, maybe you're there today, I, I get it. Maybe you're not hiding in a literal hole, but you know exactly what I'm talking about when you say, yeah, I'm, I'm too afraid of what's happening out there with this relationship or this job or this circumstance, what, what, what does it look like to be in that place? So he's hiding out in a wine press and he has his uh, first experience, Judges chapter six, verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> this, is, this is maybe my favorite part of the story because I don't mean to be irreverent, but he's hiding in a hole and the angel's like, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, I, this is just conjecture, this isn't doctrine, but like, do you think Gideon thought the angel was making fun of him? Like, excuse, are you talking to me? Excuse, <laughs> mighty warrior, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm hiding out in a hole. And what I love about this exchange, and we see this all throughout the pages of scripture, God sees in people what they often can't see themselves. God, God sees potential typically way before they see it in themselves. And, get, and, and God is here offering Gideon a new vision for his life. When he speaks mighty warrior over him, he's not making fun of him, he's speaking a new vision into his life. Now, uh, Gideon, honestly, he responds the way that I would respond. If I'm freaked out, I'm hiding in a hole, this, idiot, this angel shows up and says, uh, Lord is with you, mighty warrior, here's, here's how he responds. Uh, pardon, pardon me, my Lord, which just feels so English, right? Like it's, uh, excuse me, pardon me, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. <laughs> Translation, you got the wrong guy. Like you made a mistake. Not only am I from the wrong tribe, I'm the wrong member of the family in the wrong tribe. It's actually saying you made a mistake. In fact, I didn't know this until preparing for this message. He's from a town called Ophrah, and Ophir means the place of dustiness. <laughs> How motivating, right? <laughs> he calls the runt of his family from the place of dustiness and calls him mighty warrior. He says, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. And yet God says, no, I have the right guy. You are a mighty warrior. Is it possible that the reason so many of us can't see God's plan for our life is because we don't see ourselves the way that God does. Is it possible that we actually can't see the road ahead of us because we refuse to believe what God sees in us? God brought you into existence on purpose for a purpose. He has you wherever you're at, whatever neighborhood, whatever family, whatever job, on purpose for a purpose. And he's declaring a new vision for your life. The, the second experience we're gonna call the peace. The peace begins in uh, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So God kind of doubles down and Gideon's like still not sure apparently. So he asks God for a sign. God, how, how, can, I, how can I be so sure? So he leaves and he prepares an offering. When he comes back, uh, the Lord tells him to put it on a rock and here's what happens in verse 21. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. 
fire flared up from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. <laughs> Again, I don't mean to laugh, but like that's a little insane, right? Like shows up, he burns up his pot roast, and then he just leaves. And he's not given any context, he's not given any explanation, any like flannel graph, like what am I supposed to do with that? But what we do know is that Gideon sees God's power. He sees God's power demonstrated and it does something in him. In fact, here's how he responds. Verse 24, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. What, what's the significance of piling up some rocks and calling it an altar? Gideon's saying, I don't want to forget this moment. For the first time since they were taken into captivity, he's experienced a kind of peace. Now keep in mind, they're still in captivity. Like his experience is still on paper just as bad as it ever was. Has anyone ever experienced that kind of peace from God? Where like maybe your circumstances didn't change, but something in you did. He builds an altar, he piles these rocks to say, and I, I know that I'm prone to forget the goodness of God. I don't want to forget this. We need to do that for each other. To remind each other when we, when we look at our lives and it looks like I don't see any way out of this. I feel like the bottom has dropped out. I'm coming unraveled at the scenes. We remind each other. We become those types of altars for each other. Like don't forget God delivered you then. He's gonna deliver you again. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. So he builds this altar and for the first time he experiences peace. And the reason that he experiences this peace, I believe, is because he's encountered God's power firsthand. So let, let me just ask you, and I, again, I, I arrived last night. I don't pretend to know you or your, or your story or what you're struggling with, but I gotta ask, is there something in your life that you're trying to fight in your own strength? Is there a battle or a circumstance or a difficulty, a, a thing that you're trying to solve on your own and perhaps you desperately need to see the power of God in your life. Because peace, peace doesn't come from the absence of fear. It comes from the presence of God. It's not about this like, oh, I need to like sure up all of this energy and like become the leader or the warrior that I know that I'm supposed to be. We will feel fear at times. It's not about the absence of fear. It's about the presence of God. This is why I think it's fascinating. You know the most common command in all of scripture? Two words, fear not. It's the most common command. But it doesn't stop there. Almost every single time scripture says fear not, it's almost always followed by the words, for I am with you. He's not saying, hey, fear not because like things will turn out in the end or fear not like good, it's just around the corner. He's saying, you don't have to fear because I'm with you. The one who spoke the universe into existence, I'm with you and I'm for you. You're not alone in whatever it is that you're facing. Why are you trying to defeat it in your own strength? The third experience I'm gonna call the test. We don't really, I didn't really see this one coming. Verse 25, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So, so this is like, both a spiritual and a relational test. The first is obvious, it's a spiritual test. He's reiterating what we read in the Ten Commandments, you should have no other gods before me, right? God's reminding Gideon like, hey, this whole half in, half out thing is not, it's not gonna work. I want your complete allegiance. But the second is a relational test. Like, did you note whose altar it is? Whose altar is it that he wants them to tear down? It's his dad's. It's his father's. Gideon had to have been thinking, Lord, my family has a long history of kind of being lukewarm with you. A, a kind of being half in, half out. And he's understandably, he's afraid of what his family is gonna think. Something that I found is like sometimes the most difficult seasons of ministry have to do with the people under our roof. <laughs> like the people who have seen us at our worst that we're like doing the most life with. God is asking him to do something that's a spiritual test, but it's also a relational test. And so Gideon, he, he does go and tear it down, but he does it at night. <laughs> I, lo I love that there's still Gideon 
like wrapped up in this story. He's like, okay, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to wait till the streetlights come on, all right? I'm going to cover up the security cameras. I don't want anyone to know that I'm doing this. But God takes just that little bit of faith, and he begins to use him. So let me ask, what's that thing for you? What false idols maybe have you clung to? What difficult conversations have you not had for fear of what that person might think or say? What thing might God be wanting you to step into so that he can use you? So that you can step into the reality that he has prepared for you. What what has God maybe asked you to do that you've been afraid to do? Lastly is the victory. Verse 34, then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. In the Hebrew, actually, the language is much more like the spirit clothed Gideon. It's like God is saying, I'm, I'm the closest thing to you now. It's not just simply like a decree or a set of doctrines or a list of rules. Like the spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon. He clothes Gideon and we, we begin to see this shift in Gideon's manner. There's a transformation in him. Something begins to change. And when you read Judges 6 and 7, you see it. If you read it just in one sitting, you're like, this is, not, this is not the same guy anymore. Something has changed in him. So he blows this trumpet. He rallies everyone. 32,000 people, by the way. This is the guy that a couple of verses earlier was hiding out in a hole. He blows a trumpet. 32,000 people respond to Gideon's call, and they say, I'll follow you. I'll follow you into battle, mighty warrior. Now, 32,000 sounds like a lot, but the Midianites had like 135,000. So the odds are not great. (laughs) But then God goes and ups the ante. Verse 2 of chapter 7. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. (laughs) Can you imagine getting that memo, by the way? Like you're doing the quick math and you're like, too many is not what I would say. You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me, saying, my own strength has saved me. Gideon had to have been thinking, uh, what now? What? I have too many men? I don't don't really, I don't like where this is going. Can you imagine, like, Gideon has to now stand up in front of these 32,000 men and say, okay, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. If you're still afraid, raise your hand. And then 22,000 hands go up and they leave. He had to be thinking, that's, ah, shoot, that's not how I imagined that going. That's, this was not the battle plan that I had drawn up in my head. But God's saying, I want to make sure you know who's responsible for this victory. Who's actually really winning this battle. I don't want you to even have the 32,000 because you might possibly boast that you did it on your own. So now he has just 10,000 facing up against 135,000. And the story honestly gets even weirder. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. (laughs) This would be the part where I resign. I'm like, cool, find someone else. I'm out. Like, (laughs) hard pass. He says, take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. That's a really nice rally call, right? Thin them out, Lord? That's that's not really what I'm trying to do here. Uh, If you say, uh, if I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. And there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So he takes them to the river. It's 10,000 men. 9,700 of them do the thing that God said if they do that thing then they have to go. So he's going down with 10,000, already doing the math in his head, and another 9,700 have to go. 300 cup the water. So he's left with 300 men to face 135,000. And I'm not a math doctor, but I think that's something like odds of 450 to 1. Like not great circumstances. Then in verse 7, The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all others go home. (laughs) This is a weird story. This is a strange story. To me, it's a reminder that God not only uses unlikely people, he often uses unlikely strategies. 
Like we live in a context and a culture where it's always about having some airtight plan or strategy or blueprint, but God not only uses unlikely people, he, he uses unlikely strategies, things that we would look at and say, what? Why? How, how is this going to work? So in the middle of the night, Gideon rallies these 300 men, and he arms, he arms them with these three things, very typical for a battle, uh, a trumpet, an empty clay pot, and a torch. <laughs> if you're one of the men, are you not thinking to yourself, like, are we not taking one Glock? Not one, is that? I was told the Glock joke would play in Arizona. As, um. <laughs> but can you imagine they're passing out the stuff, like there's your trumpet, your clay pot, and your torch. You're like, I don't know what kind of battle this is, but this isn't what I would bring. Again, God uses unlikely people and unlikely strategies. So he divides them up into three groups, and uh, well, here's what happens. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. <laughs> so the Midianites, it's the middle of the night. They freak out. They run out of their tents in their PJs, right? And they're so disoriented, they turn on themselves. 300 men defeat an army of 135,000. Sometimes God's plans will not make sense to us. But God is more interested in our surrender than our strategy. God has given you an intellect. He's given you a brain. Some of you are very good strategic thinkers. But God would rather have your surrender than your best laid plans. Because many of us know this to be true. We, we look over the shoulder of our own life. There's been plenty of times where God has moved and you thought, I don't know how to explain that. That's not where I thought I would end up. That's not how I thought this would go. God's strategies, God's plans will often not make sense to us. So the question is, are we going to go with our plans or God's? Are we going to go with our plans or God's? This is why, this is why I love the Apostle Paul. Because he says things like, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Paul, Paul gets it. Like if you were to... Like, dream up a plan to save humanity. A public execution in the most shameful way possible is, would not be first on my list. Can you imagine God, like, running it by the angels? Like, is this a good idea? And they're like, no, don't do that. But Paul says the cross is foolishness. Weak to shame the strong. Foolish to shame the wise. To say... You keep bringing these airtight plans and strategies, but I want to do something completely different because the Bible is ultimately one story. Genesis, Revelation, and it all points to Jesus. It's all about him. And we worship a crucified king. The kind of execution that those watching would say, well, this looks like the end of this. That looks like defeat, but it actually led to the greatest victory the world has ever known. So I want, I want us to imagine ourselves in those four experiences. This is what I love about the Bible. It's, this isn't just a story about people thousands of years ago. I, I believe this is a story that we're also caught up in. So some of us, are, I think, are on the verge of what I would call the potential. The potential piece. Maybe you feel like you've been hiding in a wine press, but God has a different vision for your life. Maybe you don't see yourself as anyone remarkable. God wants you to see yourself the way that he sees you. Some of you maybe have never heard that. Maybe you've heard that once, but you've forgotten. God wants you to see with a new set of eyes because identity always precedes behavior. Always. Who you actually believe yourself to be will inextricably inform and motivate the kind of life that you're living. Do you see yourself the way that God sees you? The second experience is the peace. Maybe you're on the verge of experiencing the peace. Maybe like an angel is not about to burn up your pot roast, but maybe, maybe you're on the verge of experiencing God's power in a very real way. Maybe you're ready to say, I'm tired of doing this thing on my own strength, of trying to be good enough, smart enough, holy enough, successful enough on my own. My, my prayer for all of us is that we pray, God, show me your power. Show me your power in my life. 
do something in our midst that we could never possibly take credit for because it could only be you. Maybe some of us, we're at the test season. And I don't know what kind of test that is. That could be a relational test, a financial test. It could be at work or at home or in school. Let me just ask this. What will have first place in your life? I think a lot of us are probably all too familiar with like the thing that has maybe inched out God in our life. We wouldn't say that we've abandoned God. God's probably in the top five, but I'm actually more concerned with this. This thing is probably more responsible for my meaning, identity, and purpose, if I'm really, really honest. What idols do maybe we need to tear down? Some of us are ready for the victory. The odds might not be in your favor at all. You might objectively feel like someone with 300 men facing an army of 135,000, but let me tell you, that's exactly the kinds of places that God loves to show up. I can't see how this ends well for me, God. I can't see any way out. I, I don't know what you're doing. If you feel like that, you're in good company. I mean, a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, of men and women saying, Lord, have you, have you forgotten me? Have you, hello, have you, have you missed us? Did you miss the memo? Maybe God wants to do something in your life, but it starts with surrender. It starts exactly like we were saying, with open hands saying, all right, Lord, whatever I have, whoever I am, is better off in your hands than mine. I mentioned earlier this, this idea of like shame and fear and guilt is actually as my story. When I was born, um, there was complications in delivery and something happened in the delivery room in labor where my, my brain sort of slammed against my skull repeatedly, resulting in a birth defect where my, my eyes shake back and forth all the time, 24 seven. My whole world shakes. You all are shaking right now. And I didn't think much of it for the first couple of years, but you know, you know, as you like are making friends and you're learning community, like sometimes, sometimes kids can say things and, and they don't mean them this mean, but they, people started to notice and people would call me names. I remember one time a friend of mine, I was at lunch, my eyes were shaking and he's like, oh man, can you look somewhere else? Your eyes are freaking me out. And that led to a lot of not only shame, but like anger, anger towards God, towards my parents, towards the doctor, anger towards anybody that I could put the blame on. Now, as I got older, I discovered that there was a couple of things that triggered these shaky eyes, three things in particular. Um, if I was nervous, if I was dizzy, or if I was lying. My parents loved that third one, by the way. It was like, <laughs> like a built-in lie detector. It was like, where were you last night? And I was like, I was at John's house. And they're like, look me in the eye. And I'm like, eh. okay, <laughs> to your room. But I did a lot of work, honestly, to just sort of like shove all that down, but I didn't realize like how much that was me living in a hole. Convinced that God could never use someone like as broken as me. Well, fast forward, my last year of undergrad, I got a chance to spend some time in India. And uh, I don't know if you ever traveled internationally, but like one of the things that I, I love about any orphanage I've ever been to is like there's this universal sign for spin me. It's just this, right? Everywhere I go, just spin me, spin me. So we're working with this orphanage in northern India. And like, Kid after kid is saying, spin me, spin me. So I'm spinning these kids, two kids, three kids, four kids, five kids. If you remember, dizziness is one of the things that, that triggers my eyes shaking. And so now after five or six or seven kids, no joke, my eyes are shaking so bad that I actually fall over. And so I fall over and I land on my knees. And the two kids that were in front of me, like, like gasp in horror and run away. All of those years of like shame and anger just came flooding to the surface for me. Like, Lord, even here, like I'm, I'm trying to do your work here. So as I'm sitting on my knees here, I noticed that the two girls had run off and they were dragging a third girl toward me. And I thought, well, that's just mean, right? Like, oh, come laugh at the freak American, right? And they dragged this little girl here, her name's Vipna. They drag this girl toward me. And they throw her on the ground in front of me. And 
I look into her eyes and she looks into my eyes and we both see that our eyes are shaking. Friends, I don't know how to describe to you what happened in that moment. Like this girl leapt into my arms and we just, we like sobbed for what felt like an eternity. And I, I couldn't speak her language, she couldn't speak mine, she didn't care about my accolades or my accomplishments or all the things that I kind of brought to the table. In that moment, she knew and I knew that we were seen, known, and loved. It was like a game changer. In fact, about a month later, the missionary family that ran that orphanage, they sent me a letter and they said, there's no way that you could have known this, but until you came, little Vipna was always at the back of every line, she always like played by herself in the corner of every room, but since your visit. She's at the front of every line with her, held, her head held high and she says, my eyes are like Uncle Ian's eyes. Friends, <laughs> please hear me in this. You cannot be made valuable because you already are valuable. You have unsurpassable worth because you've been bought with an unsurpassable price. Every single one of us, your, your pain may explain you, but it does not define you. Your failures may explain you, but they don't define you. Your successes may explain you, but they don't define you, and yet so often we forget. So if you need a reminder this morning, here's what's true of you in Christ. Here's who you are in Christ. You are forgiven. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are a part of God's family. You are a child of God. You are accepted. You are free. You are a new creation. You are holy and blameless before God. You are precious to God. You are irreplaceable. You are worth dying for. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're set apart. You're free from condemnation. You are made complete. You are God's masterpiece. And you are loved. Listen. Yes. I know a lot of us have probably been defined by a lot of things in our lives our successes and our failures. No one has the right to define you except the one who made you. And he says you're loved. And if that voice in your head isn't first whispering grace, forgiveness, and love, it's not from Jesus. It's the voice of the enemy. If it's not first whispering forgiveness, grace, love, and mercy. That's not from God. No one has the right to define you except the one who made you, and he says you're loved. What God says about you is the most important thing about you, period. More than any letters after your name, any accomplishment, any square footage, any dollar amount, what God says about you is the most important thing about you. It, it might be shaky eyes, it might be a scar that's actually not there, but what lie have you been believing? What might God be saying to you today? God, the one who defines you is not the one who kicked you out, but invites you in. He's not the one who left you, but found you. He's not the one who overlooks you, He's the one who sees you. He's not the one who ridiculed you. He redeemed you. He's not the one that rejected you. He's the one who loves you with an unthinkable love, a love without brim or bottom. He says, you are mine. So rise up. Rise up, church. I look around this room and I see people who probably have experienced the power of God at some point in your life and we've forgotten. We believed lies. 
We believe that my value and worth is only in what I can accomplish, what I can produce. And you might be looking at your life, honestly, and you might be thinking, man, my life is a mess. But like any good artist, I wonder if God is maybe saying to us, yeah, you might see a mess, but I see what you're becoming. Yeah, you might bring this whole list of excuses, but I see what I'm leading you into. You might try to talk God out of it, say you got the wrong guy. You don't know where I've been, what I've done, or what's been done to me. God says you're no longer a slave to those things. You're my child. And I love you fully and completely. May we step more fully each and every day to that identity, to that truth. Would you pray with me? God, I, um, I know all too well uh, how to make excuses. Um, I've tried more times than I care to admit to talk you out of it, God, to say you got the wrong guy, look for someone else. And yet the beauty and scandal of the cross of grace is that you just keep coming after us. God, I pray all across this room and online for anything that we've been a slave to, maybe even things that we're slaves to right now, God, even if that's just our own voice in our head. Help us to no longer listen to the lies of the enemy, but to step more fully into our identity as sons and daughters of the King, God. We know, God, beginning first from that place changes everything. It changes everything, God. Help us to see ourselves and others the way that you see them. We thank you and we love you and we pray all of this in the beautiful and healing and victorious name of Jesus and all God's people said.